webinar. Just a note that these um, the boxes, question, comment, chat are synonymous. So depending on if you're on a tablet or a phone or a computer, they may, may be labeled differently. A reminder that this webinar will be recorded. The presentation recording and any materials presented during today's meeting will be available on the icsps.illinoisstate.edu website and on the Illinois WorkNet website within 48 hours. I will also post a link in the chat box in a few minutes to the slides for today. Tomorrow, each attendee will receive a follow-up email, which will include a survey asking you about today's webinar. Please provide feedback and any suggestions you have to help improve our upcoming webinars. A reminder that if you have a faulty internet connection or would prefer to call in, you can do so by calling into this webinar and I will place that information in the chat box or you can find it in your initial registration email. With that, I would love to get started. Um, and we have two polls that we like to start out with. The first poll I wanna ask is which partner do you represent? And you should see that on your screen. We'll give about 10 more seconds for responses. Okay, so it looks like we have most of our titles here. Um, and then we also have some other partners as well as state and local workforce innovation boards. So welcome to everyone. We have one more poll to ask. And that is, where is your local area? Okay, uh, one more, or about two more, or three more seconds to answer this poll, and then I'll share it. Okay, so it looks like we have partners from throughout the state here. Chicago, Northern Illinois is our, our largest group right now, and but we're represented throughout the state, so that's awesome. With that, I am going to turn it over to our presenter today to get us started. Thank you, Molly. Can everyone see my screen okay? Just to make sure. Yeah, we can see it great. Thank you. Well, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Richard Bush. I am the, the Dean for Career Programs at Blackhawk College. Um, still relatively new to uh, Illinois, um, Illinois and, uh, and Blackhawk College, just under two years now at this point, uh, with uh, a lovely year and a half so far under the present um, conditions. Uh, just a little background on myself. I have over 44 years of industry and educational experience, uh, almost split evenly between those, those two main industries. Uh, a lot of my background was uh, from an industry perspective in the military, uh, healthcare, uh, consulting, management, um, cable and IT consulting uh, and networking, uh, as well as uh, education. Um, I share with Molly a, a, a very strong Michigan connection. That's where I was born and spent the vast majority of my life. Um, first entering higher education as an administrator with Eastern Michigan University where I had the, the luxury of working as the uh, Associate Dean for Learning Resources and Technology. Then later moving on to Lawrence Technological University for uh, about 16 years, where uh, I, I left as the uh, Executive Director for uh, e-learning services and LTU Online. Uh, spent three years prior to coming to Blackhawk College as the founding Dean for the College of Information Technology for Baker College. 
and was uh, very pleased and happy to find the Blackhawk College opportunity and uh, the great people here at Blackhawk to begin uh, the work of, at a community college level versus a four-year doctoral granting institution level to, uh, to uh, pursue my interests of genuinely helping young people uh, who are less represented in some of our fields and uh, help them acquire the skills and knowledge they need to be um, uh, ready workforce and enabled uh, workforce uh, participants. So like all things, I've got a little bitty uh, poll that I'd like to ask everyone to participate in. Uh, might require you to either use your phone or a browser to connect to, uh, but it is uh, at menti.com, M-E-N-T-I.com. And the code will pop up here momentarily. Uh, just a question to the group, and the code is uh, at the top there as well. The question of the group is, what does immersive learning mean to you? So as you think about immersive learning, uh, what pops into your head? And uh, I'll give you about a minute to, uh, to locate that and to, um, to put in your responses, please. I'll give it another 10 seconds and then we'll see what the results look like. That's wonderful. <clears throat> Oh, excellent. Since we're getting the results, I'll let it run just a little bit more because these are great. Okay, well, I'll leave it there then, it seems to slow down. Uh, absolutely, and every one of these are uh, proper descriptions of what immersive learning is and what it's capable of. Uh, and so we'll talk about that a little bit more uh, in detail. Um, so, <clears throat> As we talk about immersive learning, and we'll, we'll, we'll compare experiential learning and immersive learning here in a moment, but as we talk about immersive learning, it has uh, garnered this aspect where virtual and augmented learning or augmented reality are being used heavily to deliver immersive learning. Augmented and virtual reality have been more often associated with the whole uh, entertainment, gaming, and leisure areas. But over the last few years, we've seen an explosion of professional applications and educational applications in this same space. Now, why this is important and why this is growing is that from the studies of from a leisure and gaming and entertainment aspect, we learn through uh, the virtual and augmented reality, how it has tied into the emotional sense and the, and the critical uh, chemical responses in the human body and in the human brain that have allowed people to find that uh, almost that natural high as a result of playing these games and engaging in these activities. As we apply those professional activities and those professional applications to the same environment using some of the same technologies, we can tap into some of those same uh, receptors 
and create uh, some very interesting outputs for uh, recall, retention of information and uh, skills development. So as Brian Tracy put in this quote, you know, it's those who can continue to uh, acquire that new knowledge and those better, better forms of knowledge are going to be the ones who can shape their lives and control their futures and to be the movers and shapers of our society as we go forward. They'll be the innovators, they'll be the creators, and they won't be afraid to learn something new, to try it, to fail at it, and to continue on. So my objective today is to really increase our discussion around the immersive learning and what it is and where it's going in the future, whatever it's going to be called in the future. Uh, but more importantly, the, the promise that, that these technologies can bring to the table for uh, employee development, student development, and the entire educational ecosystem as we look at it uh, across the portfolio of programs that we have. So when we think about experiential learning, and many of you uh, pointed to that, uh, as we all know and promote, is a learning process that is initiated by a concrete experience. And through that concrete experience, we ask students to reflect upon that experience as they go through it. So those clinical sites, those uh, clinical experiences, those internships, those work uh, activities. And as they go through and reflect upon it, and review the, the, uh, the experience itself, we ask them to think about it. You know, this is Kolb's model uh, that we're looking at here to think about the abstract pieces of it and reach some conclusions about the conceptual meaning of that experience. What did it mean to me? What was the experience? How did I experience it? What do I think of that experience? And then lead that into that act piece or that active engagement or experimentation of what I've learned and what I have done and being able to apply that to other situations. What experiential learning gives us and we've noticed over the years as educators and as uh, uh, trainers, is that this is a very natural process, one that's almost so organic that people don't even realize that they are aware, or they don't even realize they're part of a learning environment. They are just experiencing this thing and picking up skills along the way and knowledge along the way. They don't truly understand how, how organized and, and constructed it was put together for them to learn about this. Whereas immersive learning is a technique that takes these artificial and simulated environments to give the learner a, a completely immersed environment in which to learn from. In, a, in essence, it is a digital flavor of an experiential learning environment. It has the potential to bring very complex and abstract ideas together in a learning scenario that allows them to grasp it faster, more deeply, and with greater clarity than they have in the past. Thus making real everything that they learn. I mean, you know, for some of us, we have students who have gone into uh, those gatekeeper courses and struggled mercilessly with anatomy and physiology and, and things like that as they go into healthcare professions and they struggle with the concepts but immersive learning allows them to look at things in more real time and immerse themselves in that experience to fully appreciate that connection. Uh, it helps boost their motivation because of this connection, this gamification, this, this uh, interaction that they're able to have in this environment. And immersive learning environments can provide a highly interactive environment for users with both virtual and physical activity, highly sensory. So the benefits that we see quite often with respect to immersive learning is that we don't lose that hands-on approach in, uh, in teaching and learning because the students are able to, within this virtual environment, mimic and simulate a lot of the hands-on activities that we would have normally have had in an experiential learning environment. They are able to learn regardless of their preparation. We're able to see students acquire very complex content, even if they don't have some of the preparatory work that we feel they need, simply by experiencing that work, experiencing those simulations. 
what we're finding in a lot of these approaches where, where we're really trying to engage their minds and their bodies and their activity in these content areas is an increase in curiosity and in motivation for that particular area. So uh, as they're trying to understand very complex things, especially in healthcare, like anatomy and physiology, to have them see it, interact with it, makes a huge difference in terms of their ability to master it and, and develop the skills they need uh, to do well in it. For many of our employers and our uh, uh, workforce development groups, we're trying to find ways to accelerate training, which accelerate learning so we can put a, a ready workforce in the field earlier. And immersive learning can do that through an on-demand type of delivery of learning. Uh, it enriches the whole teaching experience. So the person who's in charge of trying to convey this information benefits from this as well, because it's, it's, it's not just the rote lecture and lab that we've done for decades and decades, but now it becomes a more lively, active environment uh, that we can do a lot of different things in for these students to enrich that learning experience beyond what we've done in the past, which was really good, but now we can take it to even better. And we can, del we can deliver it in a way that, that removes many of the distractions that these students are experiencing throughout their time uh, in, in this learning space. And again, for our employers and many others, and, and from a higher education standpoint, we struggle with how to deliver and educate these young people in the soft skill areas. Immersive learning allows us to create those, those environments where they can simulate working and communicating with other employees or other workers within these occupations, developing, developing their sense of communication, uh, appropriate behaviors, uh, collaborative and team working skills or team building skills so that they are better adept to interfacing with colleagues at the environment and in the workplace that they end up in at the end. The research tends, although it is, it is not as far along as we would like it to be, especially in terms of adoption and overall research, but the current themes of the research that we're seeing tend to say that, that the immersive learning really helps these students, incumbent workers, and others learn these topics easier because the emotional and intellectual connections that are created as a result of these interactions. So when I was at uh, Eastern Michigan University and Lawrence Technological University, we had um, what we call the cave at, uh, I think uh, Lawrence Tech, we called it the cave which was our augmented virtual reality uh, uh, environment. And we had the ARC, an augmented reality uh, environment at uh, EMU, uh, where we engaged, especially in those early years, engineering and architecture students. And I'm trying to bring some of that myself to Baker College to, uh, to actually leverage these technologies across the entire portfolio. And so, Healthcare and science programs are probably the, the best examples of where this can have the, the greatest impact. When we look at nursing, and the picture that you see here uh, on this slide is actually from a colleague of mine at Washtenaw Community College in Michigan, where uh, he was able to leverage uh, a grant to purchase some hollow lenses for, his, uh, for the nursing student lab because they were having some difficulties with understanding the human heart and human physiology and anatomy. Uh, and he felt that being able to see it and interact with it would make things better uh, for those students. And over the last year, he has seen some improvement in the outcomes for those students, as well as the interest and engagement and motivation uh, on part of those nursing students to succeed. They are retaining more of them. They're more of them are succeeding as a result of it. But more importantly, I think that as we look at what's happened over the last year for all of us, we've been able to use things like uh, Nurse Tim, for example, we've used that here to help fill in the gaps that COVID took away from us and, and created for us um, in terms of our clinical experiences. And we were able to use simulated clinical experiences to provide our students with some experience in the clinical setting so that they could at least have something to fill the gap 
uh, that was being denied to them because of the hospitals uh, and the restrictions based on visitors and students at those hospitals. What we found in that particular scenario where we were using uh, simulation of virtual labs and scenario-based training uh, and virtual clinic-based training is that when our students did return to the hospitals, they were pre better prepared for the stress of being on the floor for call light distractions where they've got multiple call lights going on and multiple patient needs happening at the same time. They had already worked through a simulated environment where that was taking place. They could work through different clinical sites as part of this virtual uh, clinic and gain the experiences that they needed so that when they did arrive at those hospitals for their physical clinical experiences, they were actually better prepared for the interactions that were needed as a student. And that really, you know, one of the areas that we really want to bring this to is because not only our nursing students and our health students, but all of our students who take anatomy and physiology as one of their biological requirements or biology requirements here at the campus, we're, we're looking at immersive learning, augmented virtual reality as a way to help clarify and strip away some of the complexity that are, that's associated with anatomy. And, and some of the other sciences as well. Giving students the opportunity to work through a simulated environment, come back, start it over again, until they have the opportunity to master the content and the skills necessary, whether it's a lab experience, whether it's understanding the human body better, whether it's chemistry, having that ability to rewind, if you will, review, work through, correct your mistakes, uh, is, is, is essential, I think, to the future of learning and training in our, um, in our emerging uh, economy and workforce development needs. Uh, the ability for them to interact with the contents helps them uh, maintain that connection with the topic and the retention of that information. We don't want them to just learn something today and forget it tomorrow. We want them to learn it. And because of the way they learned it, it sticks and it does, just doesn't go away. It promotes that stronger recall and that stronger retention of information. And we're seeing opportunities to use this across multiple other areas in the health professions. Um, physical therapy in terms of kinesiology and movement and being able to work with and communicate with patients. And, and that, that last piece is true against all of these, you know, being able to that soft skill of interacting with a patient uh, and, and in a clinical setting and being able to work through what works, what doesn't work and understand the different scenarios is, is uh, important and what immersive learning can bring to the table. Uh, surge techs can look at how to uh, prep a room for uh, surgery, how to, how to prep a, an OR suite for surgery and maintain a, a sterile field and what is necessary for donning and doffing of, of PPE and go through and build the muscle memory and the habits before they ever enter into a surgical suite. EMS, being able to uh, go through scenarios where they find patients or, or uh, victims uh, in different scenarios and how do you deal with them and transport them, as well as physical simulations of, of uh, ambulance, back, uh, ambulance areas and so forth. Um, the one study that I found extremely interesting was out of Taiwan on CPR training, where uh, between the uh, health sciences division and the computer science division, they created an augmented reality, virtual reality program that used various sensors to determine whether or not um, the person performing CPR and their hands in the right location were compressing at the right level, uh, were fast or too slow or what have you, uh, in a very uh, uh, realistic sense, because they were able to create an environment. So if you came up on someone and found that they had, uh, had a heart condition or a heart attack, uh, in this scenario, you could administer CPR in this scenario, not just on recessa ante, but on um, this virtual uh, person in a um, outdoor or indoor environment. Uh, and, and it was a very interesting study in how they used an Adreno computer and a multitude of sensors to uh, build this, this smart CPR training environment. But 
immersive technology, and especially with respect to augmented uh, realities, is making a major, major play for probably the last two decades in engineering and manufacturing business. And it's slowly starting to emerge more and more into uh, higher education and our ability to train the workforce. Um, and from an engineering standpoint, we've been able to do this for quite a while, is take a design idea from concept and its inception and work through that design idea all the way through until we hand it off to manufacturing. We're able to interact with that design, take it apart, put it back together again in a three-dimensional space, in an augmented space, and, and review our design, not only in relationship to the design itself, but also in how it might fit as a component of a larger piece or how it needs to be manufactured to make the, all of those pieces happen. And where are the flaws in the design or the opportunities to improve the design before it goes off to assembly and manufacturing. These technologies, again, speak to and increase motivation and interest and, and increase the engagement of the participants so that their comprehension and retention of the information is greater, but it also opens up the door for greater innovation, greater opportunity to explore what's possible as a result. We see this in industrial maintenance as well. We can now train a workforce so that they make fewer mistakes, that they have um, almost the entire manual at their fingertips. Uh, they are better and more fully trained before they go out to do that work, whether it's through an apprenticeship, an internship, or the first day on the job, which means there's far less downtime to bring them up to speed on the various equipment and technologies within that particular uh, facility. It means that they, uh, from a student perspective, from a high school student to a community college student or, or beyond, they get to immerse themselves in the experience through immersive learning about that occupation. And therefore can figure out very quickly, is this for me or not? And it helps them to connect with that occupation and what it's going to take to get uh, the appropriate training for that occupation. The interesting part with immersive learning as well is if I needed to send an employee or train someone like a student to work in a high risk environment, I can simulate that environment. I can simulate that environment. I can simulate the task that needs to be done. And I can walk them through, through this immersive learning environment multiple times until it becomes rote memory, muscle memory for them to do it. So if I had to send them out to physically repair something in a very highly uh, risky environment, they aren't going to make mistakes because they will hopefully have covered all of that through this immersive learning environment, decreasing uh, the, the issues of um, damage and danger and increasing the likelihood of an, a better outcome for the, the service that needs to be done uh, for that particular task. Many of us, uh, I'm not sure how many of us are in higher education, um, but um, many of us from industry and higher education, we've been doing virtual welding for a very long time. And the benefits of being able to do some of those manufacturing and welding skills is that it allows the student to, to hone their skills, to, to develop almost an art, a precision to what they're trying to accomplish. So that when they do go to the, to the work place, they are better equipped with you know, uh, how that should look, what that should look like. They're steadier on a uh, welding bead, for example, or they're more attentive to the details for manufacturing a particular part, which in the end reduces a great deal of material waste that employers certainly do not want uh, much of, if any. Uh, it, 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 it really ensures that someone entering that facility to do that work is well prepared and ready to do that work. Uh, one of the neat things about uh, manufacturing that we have found is that it's, it's very uh, difficult and very unsafe to put a lot of the uh, overhead or headset type materials that we use for virtual and augmented reality on someone in manufacturing. It's just not a safe thing to do. But we've been able to, uh, at some institutions, and there's a little more research that's going on, project that augmented reality onto the safety glass of the 
of the equipment so that the operator is able to see what's going on uh, physically happening within the machine. At the same time, data is being uh, represented on the safety glass so they see what's going on, what the tolerances are and all of the things that are happening as well as other information that's coming through. And uh, it helps again, reducing the equipment downtime due to failure rates or breakages uh, because they're able to interact with it better. And more importantly, as students come out to enter the workforce, they, are, they understand the nature of work better, how to operate these machines uh, with greater confidence, and in the end, turn out to be a more informed employee for our workforce partners. Some of the other areas uh, that, that immersive learning has ventured into and has um, taken a, a pretty significant role in helping to uh, uh, improve our understanding of different areas. Uh, we see it in fitness. Uh, many of us have our home gyms and you've got, your, you know, whether it's a Peloton or something else and you've got the, uh, the video playing and you're in, perhaps not as immersed, but you, you're able to interact with uh, a running program or a biking program and, and bike different parts of the world. Uh, where I think that's going to play into uh, fitness education is being able to immerse people into uh, those same environments, but on a grander scale. I see it, uh, for example, going into gymnasiums, uh, even uh, the planet fitnesses of the world kind of things, because uh, it may engage and increase the interest in physical fitness and physical activity, uh, taking care of ourselves better. Uh, I think it would, uh, it's going to play a role in improving our sports uh, fitness, uh, sports management programs, and developing other opportunities for um, you know, athletics to improve that whole uh, experience so that it's not that, you know, I, I don't know about you, but it's kind of monotonous to sit there on a bike and stare at the screen and watch CNN or whatever it is that uh, we watch. It would be much more fun to see on a grander scale and be immersed into an environment where I'm biking through the trees in the woods at the gym. That would be so much more interesting and probably wouldn't motivate me to do more and others to do more for our own physical health. From an adult education and workforce development piece, it's that continuation of, to accelerate the acquisition of knowledge and fund, foundational skills in preparation for entering the workforce and in preparation for uh, increasing uh, our skills and aptitude for the workforce to make us more employable. Um, it, it you know, uh, throughout this whole thing, immersive learning is helping to create those individuals who have greater recall of the material and can apply it to a real world situation based on what they've learned in that immersive environment. Soft skills tend to be improved significantly as well. The ability to communicate with others, uh, to manage our lives a little bit better, all of those things come together in this very timely, relevant, hands-on knowledge acquisition environment that is immersive learning and the evolution of learning in general. One of, in, in a couple of my studies, in, and I like foreign languages, I, I study foreign languages as much as I can and, and try to teach myself these things. And, from an uh, ESL perspective, from a, um, even uh, from the corporate perspective, being able to train your employees to go to other countries and speak the language or at least understand it better. Uh, immersive learning can help significantly by creating these real life scenarios where we can engage with the environment. We can have some cultural perspectives of it. It is more flexible and authentic and more interactive. And using those technologies, we can invite native speakers into those environments as, um, uh, as, as members of this virtual environment to interact with as well. Again, uh, I don't know how many of you have, have uh, learned a foreign language, uh, but when I was in Germany back in the 80s and just learning how to speak German, it took me quite a while to have the confidence to sit there and have a conversation in German with a German national in the open. Uh, it's, it's very intimidating when you're starting to speak foreign language uh, to a native speaker uh, in, in the first place, but being able to go through, practice, rewind, re and practice some more helps with uh, that confidence and that self-efficacy around 
this idea of language. Uh, again, creating better recall and knowledge retention, but more importantly, creating an opportunity to be creative in our language uh, and in our constructs of language in that second language gives us the opportunity to be able to, to make those connections uh, more readily, um, making us a little more native in our ability to speak uh, in many ways. Um, first responders and criminal justice students tend to be able to leverage these things. We don't have them here as much as we would like, but the ability to hone our skills more deeply, uh, have them understand uh, how to interact in various situations, um, be able to present them with simulations of situations so that they have to go through and think through, how do I deal with the public in this particular situation or in that particular situation or uh, what do I need to do? Immersive learning, these simulated environments give us an opportunity to safely engage in those conversations and to engage in uh, building confidence and uh, skills to deal with those situations. And obviously, uh, from a employer perspective, but also from an institution, higher education institution perspective, being able to take people through safety training. Um, being able to take them through ladder safety and fall safety and all of those things. It's, it's very, very different than reading about it and going through the manuals. It's another thing to actually go through the process of how do I, um, how do I put out a fire virtually using, own those skills? How do I have a good spray uh, of, of a fire uh, extinguisher to put out a fire? Am I too high, too low, too left or right too much? Uh, and all of those other aspects. We can actually bring uh, a, a more robust training opportunity for people relative to uh, safety training. And I don't wanna leave out any of our other areas, uh, history, literature, psychology, automotive, and others are also impacted by and benefited by uh, immersive learning opportunities. Many will leverage sounds and images and videos to simulate the, uh, the environment that we're in and to bring to life things. The, the picture in this particular slide, if you look at it, this gentleman is uh, on the Normandy coast, one of the villages just out, uh, outside the Normandy coast. And the augmented reality is showing soldiers carrying a wounded soldier off the field of battle into a aid station, probably. And it's, it's being able to bring history to life. Uh, imagine students who have to take a history class now being transported through virtual or augmented reality to that place in time and having a discussion about what they're seeing and how things are happening around them. Literature, having textbooks and, and uh, novels come to life as a, and interacting uh, within that environment or at least uh, sitting there and watching it play out and understanding it uh, is, is an interesting way of enriching our understanding of some of these liberal arts, uh, humanities uh, type fields as well. So, you know, kind of starting down the path now to, to wind this down to our Q&A session, uh, a lot of what the, the material that we've experienced over the years, the research that's taken place, the, the uh, small implementations and the small adaptations of these technologies what we have found is that by leveraging, leveraging them with an intentional design around what it is we're trying to ask students to learn, we can uh, enhance the content that the students are interacting with, regardless of the content, which improves their skills and mastery and better prepares them for the potential occupations they're looking at. And all of these things tap into the emotional, intellectual, behavioral, self-efficacy and confidence the whole sensory aspect of learning. It's not just that sage on the stage kind of component where we're listening to the lecture, reading the textbook, taking the test, going to the lab if there was a lab and doing something in the lab, but instead opening up the world and opening up the possibilities to create these stronger connections and embrace and foster those connections even further. So as we go and, and we're looking at uh, the future, whatever the future is going to be called. Um, I think that, that as we go through this age where we look at immersive learning 
as a uh, as something we should employ in greater number in education and in training. Uh, we're going to watch it fall apart as well. It's going to fall to the side in terms of a moniker for what we're talking about. Education will not by itself be tied to the future of mid, uh, these monikers, whether it's education or training, uh, even on, on the job training, or even the modalities of, of education of, you know, is it in-person, is it face-to-face, -face, online, hybrid? These things I think will come together and we will be looking at truly not only a technology uh, enabled learning environment, but more of an enhanced learning environment where all of these things come together. We won't be talking about them by these siloed uh, monikers. We'll be talking about the reality of learning, training, learning, uh, where it could include a little bit of lecture and lab, textbooks, a whole lot of sensory input, psychomotor, emotional, cognitive, as ways of uh, genuinely creating a very full experience, a very um, comprehensive learning environment where um, much like that experiential learning, uh, immersive learning will be able to take it to that next level and we experience it uh, virtually and physically at the same time. One of the things that I would invite you to, uh, if you go out to YouTube uh, in, the, in the days to come, one of my favorite YouTube videos was by Corning. Uh, it was a concept video that they put out called A Day Made of Glass. And at about the three minute, 12 second, area, you start to see how an immersive work environment, an immersive learning environment, an immersive world might begin to look like uh, as a result of this. And that's where I was inspired by this when it first came out in 2011. And looking at how can we create these environments? Because to me, the greatest benefit is how we leverage these environments and these technologies to not only meet the student that we, the student and the worker that we have today, but that student and that worker who doesn't see themselves in these occupations, who uh, can't figure out how to get started, who are in those underserved and underrepresented populations where they just don't feel they have the opportunity, but if we can bring them in and give them the opportunity to experience it, either through immersive, well, especially through immersive learning, we will be able to help them develop their workforce skills and their workforce potential. So whatever replaces this in the future, whatever uh, immersive learning evolves into, we know that it's going to be something that will always enhance the teaching and learning experience. That is something that we as educators strive for every day. Um, none of us are, are satisfied with what we did yesterday. Lectures and labs are fine, but we can do better in immersive learning. We'll bring that to the table. We want our students to be active learners and immersive learning, leveraging these technologies, giving them the, the experience of uh, even a simulated reality will help uh, connect deeply into their minds and create these active learning environments where they can't help but be active learners. It will open the door for more personalized education for these, these students. It will contextualize it. It will allow us to culturalize some of this education. Imagine being able to create a uh, scenario simulation where the individuals, um, an individual who might be uh, from an underrepresented population or ethnicity in that simulated environment, there are more people like him or her in that environment. Um, maybe a female in a manufacturing environment, she's more females in that manufacturing environment. The ability to communicate even subtly that you too can belong to these workforce environments is very powerful and what we can bring to these simulated environments. We can work on getting, truly getting rid of and addressing the soft skill question that every employer I've heard for the last 22 years has said they need more and more of. Uh, and, and through this environment, we can create those scenarios where we have to have those critical conversations. How do we work together, team building, uh, showing up to work on time, all of those things, how can we do that? And we can do some of that in these immersive environments. Um, and more importantly, we can prepare our students to be ready to go to work, much more ready than they have been in the past. And they will be very confident and very, very uh, ready to self-advocate and, and have self-efficacy 
as they enter the workforce. So these things are still emerging. You know, we're seeing them in pockets. Uh, some of us have more of it, I'm sure, on this call than others. Uh, some of us have thought about it in, in some of the more traditional areas like engineering and design. Uh, with COVID, we're now probably looking at it across more of the portfolio of programs and training that we have available to us. But we need to uh, consider these possibilities, be creative in our, impl uh, of our uh, implementation of these things and apply them constructively, intentionally, sensitively to what we're doing to enhance and create the environments that we're dreaming of. And we've been dreaming of for a very long time. So uh, Molly, let's, let's open it up for some uh, questions if you don't mind. Awesome. So yes, um, <coughs> feel free to post any questions in the chat. I'll go through and read some of the comments that we have had. Let's see here. Someone um, noted that for them, immersive learning means fully involved virtually. Um, another participant noted that as an X language instructor, it would have been very helpful to them to have had tools like this in the classroom. Um, I would love that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, as, I, as I mentioned, I'm, I'm teaching myself, uh, maintaining my German, my French, my Italian, my Spanish. Uh, my Hebrew, Arabic, Chinese, and Hawaiian. Those are the ones that I'm working on. And wow. in an immersive environment like this, uh, I've been working on them for a couple of years and using different apps to try and work through those languages. And, and um, an immersive app like this, oh my goodness, it would have been amazing. Um, the way that I learned German the easiest, and I, I went through high school learning Spanish and I went to was deployed to Germany, um, was, you know, and if you want to learn the language, you go to the local restaurant or you go to the local bar, you have a little dinner, you talk to the people there and you eventually begin to learn that language. And that's how I learned German was on the street from these people. And uh, an immersive learning environment could recreate that opportunity and uh, literally uh, allow you to virtually meet these people and, and uh, interact with them. And yeah, I, I think it's, it's a piece that was grossly missed uh, over the last few years, how it could have really helped, especially for their ESL students and, and others. Great. And, you know, both myself and another participant said, wow, to when you listed the languages you're working on. So that is very impressive. Um, let's see, what else do we have? Um, we've gotten fantastic presentation. Um, Someone said many employees in the future will be in virtual meetings with international colleagues as meeting avatars um, or all meeting as avatars. Um, so that's what we have so far. Are there any other questions or comments that people have that they'd like to like to post? If, if I can, while they're posting, I, I you know, going back to that one where um, the, the virtual avatars and, the, and that, that, that whole environment uh, back in um, when, when Second Life started to emerge onto the scene uh, way back, I want to say 1999, 2000, uh, we were sitting at Eastern Michigan University um, and, and thinking about what's the future of education look like. And when I think back to what we thought it was going to look like, and, and just to give you a hint, we were looking at Second Life going, hey, you know, we could create a virtual campus, virtual version of Eastern Michigan University. And students could drive their virtual cars walk across the virtual campus, go to the, each of the virtual classes that they would attend. And, you know, they would be attending in real time, but they would be attending as avatars in this environment. To only think that today, for example, we don't have to have something as like an avatar necessarily. We can actually project ourselves. And I think as the technology evolves and becomes less expensive and becomes more sophisticated, uh, the, the idea of a hologram, being able to project yourself as a hologram into a space, into a virtual space. Um, and, and that's your avatar for lack of better words uh, and creating a more realistic environment. Isn't that far away uh, when we think about it? I mean, in, in the 40 years that I've been in information technology, uh, where we were to where we are today is just incredible uh, in my mind. And where we will be in the next five to 10 years is gonna be amazing. And I think COVID has helped accelerate a lot of that.
Awesome. I don't see any other questions in the chat at the moment. Is there anything else anyone has in terms of questions or comments? While you are typing, um, you will all, as I mentioned, receive a survey tomorrow um, to complete, but I'm also going to post that in the chat right now, just in case you want to complete it while this presentation is fresh in your mind. Um, so let me just post that link really quickly here. And you'll get this again by email, but feel free to complete it now. Is there anything that helps that you have, Richard? Aside from my uh, uh, gratitude for everyone attending this morning and um, the opportunity to speak on this, um, hopefully in the uh, years to come, I'll be able to report back on some of our progress in these areas and uh, as well as where the industry is going uh, more and more with immersive learning as well as with whatever it becomes in the future, because uh, like everything else, it'll continue to evolve uh, and adopt new technologies and integrate itself more and more into everything that we do. Uh, so it's, it's gonna be exciting. Someone just asked, uh, do you see remote driving for cars and airplanes? I, I do. Um, when I, I lived in Michigan for uh, most of my life, I was part of Automation Alley and worked very closely with uh, uh, our engineering programs and our automotive suppliers in Michigan. Uh, the amount of money, the amount of research that's going into autonomous driving, especially uh, aircraft, that's a whole different question. That's, that's I think, still quite a ways down the road, but automated, uh, automated uh, uh, vehicles is, uh, there's no doubt in my mind that that's not a fad. It's, it's gonna become more and more of a reality. Um, what I think, that we haven't really gotten into more is the infrastructure needs um, and some of the more advanced infrastructure that could make uh, autonomous vehicles even more uh, likely and safer. You know, I think we need smart road surfaces. We need smart um, uh, technology in uh, even signage and uh, and uh, the communications that can go on. We, when I was with Automation Alley, we talked theoretically from a standpoint of everything needs to be talking to everything. Um, so even cars that are not autonomous, um, older makes and models need to be retrofitted with uh, some intelligence so that they can communicate their presence in the world with other uh, vehicles. Um, you know, you need municipalities who can look at traffic flows and, you know, someday we probably won't have traffic lights. There won't be a need for them because this, the cars will be smart enough to know they need to slow down or they speed up or stop or what have you to make way for uh, traffic patterns. So. I do think it's going to happen. I, I, uh, I would say that it, we're not that far off. Um, five, 10 years from now, I think we'll see some major, major leaps and more and more vehicles on the road that are self-driving. Um, but it, you know, there's some legal concerns too. There's, there's some laws that need to be created and, and uh, liabilities and insurance. I mean, it, the impact of that goes well beyond just the fact that a car is driving itself. Uh, so it's it's uh, it's that whole ecosystem that wraps around it. That's going to be kind of interesting to look at down the road. Awesome. Um, the last comment that was posted is a thank you to you and um, Mark Lohman on the call is located in the Black Hawk College District as well. So Showing we that. love working with Mark in, in the American Job Center here in, in the Quad Cities region. Uh, he's, he's an excellent partner, and, and thank you, Mark, for being here today. Great. Well, uh, do you have anything else? If not, I'll wrap us up. Unless there are any other questions, I'm, I'm, I'm good to go. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, everyone. This concludes this webinar. Um, I posted a link to the survey in the chat if you want to fill it out today, or if not, you'll receive a follow-up email, um, and we look forward to reading your comments. So thanks so much for your participation, and we will see you later.
Bye-bye.